हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग um okay now i guess that by now you have a lot of huge amount of information uh and ideas and hypotheses to go through and to uh i mean you have to process all that information to make sense of it and to and to i mean i would say to make it more palatable and the goal of this session is to try to um identify some general principles uh, that to some extent help us to um clarify uh, those ideas to place them into context and to see what are the contrast between some between some of the uh hypothesis and and ideas that we have had over I mean, from the speakers in this in this seminar and i'm not going to monopolize this um session by asking questions myself although i have produced a list of questions that i um uh willing to use uh but um i would like to bring some i would say some structure to this session by um by actually using the title of the seminar that was very carefully chosen um uh, one of the aspects that i wanted to emphasize and to address in this seminar was this evolutionary perspective so the idea as you can you will have seen all of these speakers not by chance um are com- are comparative psychologists or biologists they all use evolutionary theory to address the questions that they are interested in and uh and then they they uh, uh, i mean they, they they make comparisons they for example study animals in the wild and in captivity or they study different species uh very often or at least in the history of comparative psychology there was there were a number of claims and and debates about what what was the um model of evolution that should be used to guide these comparisons to choose the species that were adequate to address these questions and so my i would say that um it is very often the case that people regard evolution as a sort of um i would say history of improvement or uh, this uh, the, the model of the ladder view of evolution in which species are ranked and then as i think has mentioned at some point in some of the uh, talks a human species is considered unique and then um people might 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 think that by saying that humans are unique we are saying that non-humans are all almost the same and they are in a different box so we are comparing humans with non-humans and and actually that is not obviously is not the point i mean it's not the the position that the speakers have and i don't think that's a dominant position anyway in the field but um this is something which very often happens in these comparative studies which is we study developmental history and evolutionary history and sometimes we sort of may think that the way we approach developmental issues can be based on this idea of the phylogenetic scale so um so this is a point that i i i, I would like to ask um to what extent when um researchers study developmental 
uh, issues and they use different species, they are, um, they control this uh, idea that, uh, I mean, this has to do with the biogenetic law. I mean, with the idea that uh, maybe development in different species um, correlates with how ancient this species is, and then we are expected to see the emergence of the different traits in a certain order, which might map onto the way they appear in the evolutionary history. Like, um, one might say that um, chimpanzees reach the state uh, um, where humans um, well go on, like when they um, we compare uh, cognitive skills, and then we say, uh, okay, they, it seems that at such an age, like three days old, they start, humans start to, go, uh, to carry on developing um, more sophisticated skills, where uh, chimpanzee, adult chimpanzees, they are arrested, and they don't go on. Um, so to what extent researchers in this area uh, control for that way of thinking? Okay, is that? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, well, I, I think there are two, two sort of ideas about evolution which I think you've kind of alluded to there that I would set aside and say, no, don't let's do that. One is the simple sort of what used to be called echelle des etres, the sort of scale of being um, and the notion that we can trace culture as it goes up some kind of linear scale. And the other one is the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny and, and so in the development of the child we can see all the sort of stages of uh, evolutionary history recapitulated and acted out. Um, I mean there's some truth I, I think in that but uh, <clears throat> there can be some truth but as a general rule we now know it, it's not true. Natural selection acts on every stage of development and, and manipulates that and so for example in human children in infancy we already see signs that they're going to be creatures who are going to acquire language, and you see uh, pre-verbal in interactions and so on which, which prefigure language, so that's already there in infancy. So as it's setting those aside, how do we take an evolutionary approach? And to me, there are two main ones, and I think other, other people on this panel certainly use one or, or both. One is um, to uh, attempt some kind of phylogenetic reconstruction where what you look at is what some group of animals share and on the basis of what they share you make inferences about the ancestry in the same way as we look at say all birds and find they're feathered and most of them fly and from that we make inferences about their ancestors uh, which could as well explain why they're all like that. Um, and so for me it's been particularly important to look at, say, uh, great apes as a group and see what we share with them as a basis for making inferences about the ancestry we share um, and which formed a, an evolutionary foundation for the distinct cultures that have later evolved in all those species, including ourselves and in including, of course, our cumulative culture, which I think, you know, like we'd all agree on, makes, makes us distinctively different. But that didn't come out of the blue. It was built on foundations which we can infer from that comparative approach. And so just to give one example in the case of the great apes, I think the evidence from orangutans from Carol von Scheich's studies and ours on, on chimpanzees um, is that the probably the ancestry of the great apes involve multiple tradition cultures of very diverse types, including social behaviors, foraging techniques, and so on. Uh, and that would have formed a foundation for what came later. Um, and then the other evolutionary approach is to look for evolutionary convergences, which can be really quite instructive. And I think the case of teaching that, that Kevin Leyland talked about more this morning, where we're looking at ants and meerkats, um, is telling us something about the sort of functional properties of, of teaching and the circumstances in which it might evolve. Um, so that can be instructive as well, and that's a very different approach than the one looking for sort of phylogenetic shared features. Yeah. Um, as a hello, um, as a developmental psychologist, let me just say a little bit of something about the relation of evolution and development. I think that's something that needs 
a lot more work and attention. Um, I've been having a discussion with um, Kristen Hawks and Sarah Hurdy about some uh, issues about um, uh, cooperative breeding, and they think that a lot of the st distinctively human things arose as what are called ontogenetic adaptations, that is, adaptations for that infants for communicating with their mothers in this special case where compared to the other great apes, human babies are left alone. They're ignored compared to the other where, they st where the great apes stay on there. And they have multiple uh, caretakers. And so they have to uh, 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 communicate at a distance and form these relationships uh, uh, it's in a more challenging social environment than the other great apes. Um, on the other hand, I've emphasized um, some of these things that would be adult uh, adaptations like collaborative foraging. Uh, and then when you see that in children, this is so-called deferred adaptation. This is the time it takes to build up these skills, but the actual adaptive context was for adults. But in talking with them about it, um, it comes out, and this is something that's not even discussed very much by the Evo Devo people, uh, and that is that if you had an adaptation for a particular uh, developmental period, that is, it was selected to be effective in a particular period, it can migrate up and down development by virtue of random variation and when it occurs. So if something is, is uh, adaptive at a particular age, there's going to be random variation in the population of exactly how many days old you are when it comes. And if the younger you get it, those guys have an advantage, uh, it can migrate down. And if you had something that was adaptive for infants, and those who kept it a little longer, this is the neoteny kind of uh, pattern, those individuals who kept it longer kept an advantage, it can migrate up uh, in ontogeny. So um, there, you know, for all the reasons that Stephen Jay Gould in his classic 1977 book and um, Mary Jane West Eberhard in her recent, more recent book uh, have argued, there are some reasons why ontogeny quite often has some <laughs> relation to phylogenetic sequences, but, uh, um, uh, but ontogeny can do lots of other things uh, um, in the process. And I'll uh, second what Andy said, um, that um, one of the proposals we've had about shared intentionality, for example, is that infants are already doing this kind of emotion sharing that a lot of people, Trevarthan and other people have talked about in infants, uh, from two or three months of age. They're engaging in, 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 a, in a special way, smiling and laughing in ways that other apes don't do, smiling and laughing at a distance socially that other apes don't do. Uh, and it's not until later that they actually understand others as having goals and perceptions the way that apes do. So the uniquely human part actually starts earlier, and then when the great ape part comes of understanding others as agents, um, these combine somehow in, in ontogeny to create a unique uh, product. So anyway, I would just emphasize that I, I think this relation between phylogeny and ontogeny uh, has been of great theoretical interest, uh, but um, uh, the Evo Devo people have been on a fairly high theoretical level and haven't gotten down to a lot of the specifics and specific uh, um, um, creatures, and I think in the kinds of things that we've been talking about here, that would be a really fruitful line for uh, future research. I endorse everything that Andy and Mike have said. I just wanted to add um, one further comment, which is, which is slightly mischievous, but um, I reckon I've learned more about culture by studying fishes than by studying primates or uh, any, any particular species that might happen to be, to be close to humans. And taking that comparative perspective, I think one, um, one, can, one can do what Andy does, which is, which is a valuable contribution. One, one searches for homology and tries to reconstruct um, ancestral states and, and uh, make inferences about the evolutionary history of a trait. 
Um, but to the extent that one is taking the other perspective that Andy mentioned and looking for convergence, and to the extent that one's willing to endorse a broad perspective of the, of the characteristics that one is uh, interested in, like in this case a broad definition of culture, then it, it becomes a practical issue which animals you focus in on. And um, you know, while it would be wonderful to set up large numbers of populations of chimpanzees and Japanese macaques, um, uh, because what you need if you're interested in studying many of the population level aspects of, of, of culture is you need large numbers of replicate populations of animals, not just large numbers of animals. And while it'd be great to have uh, the, the experimental scenario where you have large numbers of populations of animals, uh, you know, only Mike and you know, one or two other very, very lucky researchers in the world have, have access to, the, to those kind of resources. And, uh, but what you can do is you can go out and you, you can very easily set up large numbers of populations of fishes, okay? which would be totally useless if fish were not very good at social learning. But as it turns out, they're okay. So you can explore some aspects of, of, of social learning processes and, and start to look for patterns and, and start to see um, uh, trends. And, and, and um, you might be surprised when you see, for instance, that the same strategic rules are being deployed by minnows and human beings. And, and in fact, we have quite a lot of evidence for convergences in what we see in our fishes and uh, what we see in other taxonomic groups. So I, I would suggest that uh, researchers should uh, take a horses for courses uh, approach to uh, thinking about what model systems they deploy when addressing evolutionary questions and, and, ask, and, and consider the practicalities of, of working with particular taxonomic groups because some are more likely to provide um, fruitful insights in, into the nature of processes. That's not to say that you know, um, it, it follows that chimpanzees will learn in the same way that, that minnows do. Of course they won't. But uh, nonetheless, we can gain insights into the processes and uh, get a deeper understanding Understanding, which will then contribute to, to our, our, our comparative perspective. So um, it seems to me that there's been, uh, so I agree completely that this sort of onward and upward approach to evolution that we start with, you know, sort of the, the old fashioned uh, scale of being is incorrect. But one of the things that's been missing from this meeting from all the talks, including my own, is um, the actual history of uh, what we know about the transition from chimpanzees to, to humans. Uh, and uh, I actually think we know quite a bit about that. Uh, we've had no paleontology, no archaeology uh, in, in this history. And even more important, I think, a, a lot of the discussion, I know nobody thinks this up here, but uh, just so that all you know we don't think it, the, it, 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 when you talk, as we've all talked, it's almost as if evolution has taken place against a background of a constant environment. But that's wildly untrue. The, when now people think that humans and, and, and chimpanzees probably separated eight million years ago, um, uh, so that's the sort of late middle Miocene, the world was an entirely different place than it is now. It was wetter and warmer and much more constant environment-wise. And in the last two million years, the world's climate has changed in, a, in just staggering ways. And the last two million years have been, especially the last 800,000 years, have been a period of immense, intense, high amplitude, short period climate variation in a way that as far back as we can see, it has never been before. And so when you're thinking about the evolution of cumulative culture and all the things we're talking about, <clears throat> you should also keep in mind that um, for example, the brain size in mammals, relative brain size in mammals has increased um, something like a factor of three over the last 65 million years, and half of that increase has been in the last two million years. Um, and uh, lots of theoretical reasons for thinking that uh, uh, cultural evolution is more beneficial when you have um, high amplitude climate fluctuations so that uh, the kinds of environmental problems that populations face change on 500 or 1,000 year time scales too fast for genetic evolution to keep up, but too slow for individual learning to be much use. Um, and all of this is a background which we should think about because when we think about 
culture, we often think about it as, well, it's just better, and, and obviously every animal would like to land on the moon. Uh, but in fact, there, a good argument can be made that it's an adaptation to a particular environment, which is the uh, high, high amplitude, uh, relatively short time period fluctuations of the, of the, of the Pleistocene, the last two million years. Could I maybe just just add one thing? Yeah, sure. To that, I don't, or do you want to go on to other other questions? No, I, I mean, you I, want I just to had another thought about that. What what Mike Mike made this uh, interesting comment about uh, the possibility of uh, neoteny, which I'm not sure everyone here knows what neoteny is, but neoteny is basically I, the idea that <coughs> uh, the way in which the development is structured uh, changes um, over time. So parts certain segments, as it were, of the developmental system get shifted relative to others. And in the human case, what, what Gould proposed was that um, we are essentially juvenile apes. So all of you, all of us, are in some important sense juvenile apes were apes that never quite grew up. And the aspects of juvenility have been advanced into adulthood. And that could have interesting implications um, in terms of, uh, I mean, if you think some of the characteristics of primate juveniles being very playful, innovative, flexible, and so on, uh, which kind of fits with the way that we as adults are. And I'm, I, I was just reflecting on how often I've heard members of this, this panel up here in the last couple of days say, I've just been playing with some really interesting ideas. I've been playing with that model, and uh, you know, adjusting some variables and seeing how they come out. Uh, we keep talking about playing at science. Um, and so, um, what I wanted to do is connect that with just one slight objection uh, I had to uh, the central point uh, that um, Kevin Leyland made this morning, and then he, he quoted Mike as saying, ah, yes, and, you know, that's right, that um, high fidelity copying is, as it were, the key to culture, uh, cumulative cultural transmission. Um, I mean, I don't disagree that it, 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 it's, uh, it's crucial in the sense that it's necessary, uh, but there was almost an implication there that it might be sufficient or, you know, the magic factor. Um, and one uh, example, I think, of that, uh, since we were just talking about the evolutionary past, is the stage of the Stone Age when there was a shift from Alduan to a Shulian uh, blade. You know, those wonderful pear-shaped symmetrical uh, stone tools very difficult to make uh, and to make them so symmetrical and so on. You need high skill to do that. And so that was a certain sign of cumulative cultural evolution starting, as it were. We went from the old one to the Acheulean. Surely that's a, a step up. That's cumulative. However, it then got stuck for a million years. And it seems difficult to doubt that for that transmission to go on, making these beautiful uh, complex tools for a million years didn't involve high fidelity transmission, Surely it did, but there was no accumulation. So it needs something else. And I think we'd all acknowledge, you know, there are two central features to cumulative cultural evolution. You need the transmission, and that has to be high fidelity, but then you need the innovation. And I think that was somehow what, what hominins were waiting for for a million years um, uh, at that stage of our evolutionary history. And so what it needed is for something, maybe the brain had to get bigger, uh, individuals had to get more innovative uh, to go one step beyond uh, the Acheulean. Maybe one way in which that could happen is this kind of neotenous approach where people became more flexible and exploratory uh, in later stages of, of development. I mean, that's very speculative, but um, I was just putting those two things together since I had that, that thought about the fidelity um, was just buzzing around in my mind since those talks. <laughs> okay. I wonder... Just, just to be clear, uh, <laughs> I would say... <laughs> Fidelity is necessary, but clearly not sufficient. Good. <laughs> what do you say? Let me, uh, well, they're all too nice, so I'm going to be. <laughs> uh, so um, I think the Acheulean is a huge puzzle. And uh, because if you have high fidelity transmission, you shouldn't have constancy on spatial scales. Like, uh, I mean, the Acheulean was constant, not just for a million years, but across the western half of Eurasia. So, and interestingly, it never developed except for one brief instant in eastern Eurasia in the Boza Basin. So, uh, I don't think that the Acheulean fits at all with the idea that there was high fidelity cultural transmission because you should see, you should see local variation in styles. We have a lot of Acheulean 
tools. I mean, places like, like Oler Gasaili, there are literally paved with Acheulean tools, and yet you don't see uh, any of the stylistic variation you begin to see in the, in, um, the last half of the Middle Paleolithic, so with so-called the Valois, you know, uh, mode three tools and so on. So um, uh, I don't think we understand the issue early in uh, Claudio Tenney, one of um, Mike's postdocs previous, I guess, or uh, PhD student. students, has advanced the idea that, it's, that, they were, that there was a genetic template that, so Acheulean tools were like bird's nests or beaver dams, things which involve no social transmission or, or minimal social transmission, and that the constancy of form was built out of some kind of, you know, uh, innate template. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but, but I, I don't think that what we see in the Acheulean fits with, with high fidelity cultural transmission, because if, it, if you had high fidelity cultural transmission, you should see stylistic or non-functional variation on spatial scales that aren't in the, you know, tens of thousands of kilometers. So, so yeah, so I don't, we I don't, can actually well, have a little discussion. I don't see, I mean, to have that variation, you need to have innovation, and, and, and so and that's what I'm saying, you know, seem, seem to be lacking in going beyond the Acheulean. Perhaps that explains why there wasn't variation within it as well. Um, the idea of an innate template, I don't know, that, that just seems weird to me. I mean, surely we would still have that, right? I mean, you'd just be able to sit down and make an Acheulean axe, uh, and I, I don't think any of us could do that remotely. I, I don't see why we should still have it. If, oh, well, I, mean, okay. uh, well. I mean, if the whole point is flexibility, selection could have erased that. I mean, the idea that selection only takes, I mean, taxonomists would like it to be true that, you know, you only go one direction, but it, it you know, we, there's lots of examples in evolution of traits that evolve and then get undone, so. The idea of an innate template is a contentious idea in and of itself, even for bird's nests, or whatever it is that, that gives rise to the fact that Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, I, I, I was saying that I wonder if the question I'm going to ask now is related to the issue that was brought up right now, which is, and this is for uh, Carl directly. Uh, could you uh, explain what's the difference be between your cultural intelligence hypothesis and the, the as you said, the Vygotskian version of the cultural uh, hypothesis that Mike uh, proposed? Well, it's very simple. There is no difference. <laughs> in, in the sense that, I mean, basically I'm echoing everything that's been said before. We're looking at <clears throat> sort of niche construction ideas that by, by emphasizing the role of development and especially the conditions during which development takes place, you realize that selection can act on that and then change things. So especially when it comes to intelligence, which isn't there at birth, you know, I was, I was qu quip that the, you know, the biggest brain animals are born the most stupid, right? And they, they have to learn everything. And that means that, that selection can act on those processes. And so you take your average developmental process, and, which was my point, and species that, have, that happen to have great opportunities, then you know, efficiency of selection and so on, they, they can then you know, go on another path than other species. And of course, the whole point of, of our exercise was to say that humans are, of course, unique and special, but uh, echoing uh, Kevin again, these processes we actually see everywhere, <clears throat> but they, you know, they're, they're, they're built up in different stages or t t expressed to different extents in different lineages. But the key difference remains, of course, the, the accumulation in humans that we don't see in other lineages, which we're all struggling to, to explain where you know, the combination of teaching imitation seems to be the key. But basically, what we do is we take the Vygotskian approach to development and apply it evolutionarily. I think that's, that's the, so I don't see a difference actually, but maybe Mike does. Well, well uh, uh, obviously, I agree in the in the big picture that there's this continuity in these cultural processes. We actually yielded the term cultural intelligence <laughs> to you uh, to, to apply to the broader thing, and then adopted the more narrow Vygotskyan intelligence as the human version of the cultural intelligence. So, so it's it's part of the same general thing, but it has some special properties. And I would say. Um, 
uh, hearkening back to my talk uh, yesterday, that uh, this cooperative dimension to things. So if you notice in Kevin's graphs up there in the comparison of the kids and the chimps, the, the, the two ones that were the absolute outliers, only children and all the way up to the top, are teaching and prosociality. And teaching is a prosocial act. You're donating information to the other one. You wouldn't do that if it was your competitor. You don't give your competitor, you don't teach your competitor how to do things. So, um, uh, uh, so I actually think that insofar as the teaching, and of course I've argued also that linguistic communication evolved as this cooperative communication to, to not only to teach, but just to inform people of specific things, where things are, to inform them how to do their part in a collaboration better and all that sort of thing. So I, I actually think that, uh, I've come to think that the cumulative culture, depending on teaching, is part of this more cooperative way of doing things. So the cooperative, coordinative dimension changes the transmittive dimension. Um, and um, that the, the, nucle the uniquely human version is this great ape version, as especially Andy has, uh, um, um, the whatever it is, the pan cultural, uh, the, the, uh, the, the chimpanzee uh, cultural um, uh, pattern, uh, infuse it with this greater amount of collaboration and shared intentionality and things uh, like that. So uh, it's absolutely continuous with uh, what uh, Carl and everybody else is saying, but um, uh, I've tried to focus on that uniquely human part. Just to add a footnote to this, and that is that <clears throat> it's really the interaction effect that is the unique element here because we see, and we, we, we would like to study more deeply, some other species that have very modest uh, cognitive endowments, but that also go the cooperative route, and that's, you know, I like to call them the cooperative breeders, species with extensive alimaternal care, where it would be really interesting to see, for instance, we see this, this emergence of teaching, it needs to be shown more, more quantitatively, but it, you know, there's all kinds of suggestions there. Of course, given their small brains, they're never going to take off to be a second lineage of humans. But again, what we're seeing is general processes and what is the unique element is how they came together in human evolution, not that something, you know, that we, need, uh, we needed some, some divine intervention to understand how humans evolved. Just to add a, a second footnote, I, th I think we can um, also connect uh, teaching and um, broadly conceived to include sort of telling and uh, information transmission to the kind of stuff that Rob was talking about. Uh, human culture is obviously built on um, norms and, and institutions and um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, many, many norms in human societies, many, many institutions are are, are not perceptually transparent. You can't look at them and understand what's going on. Um, you know, when I get back, I'm going to have to fill in my taxes. You know, you could not work out that you need to fill out, fill out your taxes by the 31st of whatever month um, through just observing, imitating other people's behaviour. Um, you know, uh, I may well have to write a check at the end of it, and it is not perceptually obvious that, you know, that if I write this check and I send it off, that money will be transferred between these. The whole concept of money is just not, not obvious. Uh, so all of these things have to be learned, and, and, and I think they're learned through, through teaching and, and instruction uh, and telling. And, and, and so teaching becomes absolutely critical to that huge amount of large-scale cooperation that we see in human societies. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mike, could you uh, make a short summary of what's the current thinking uh, on this debate on whether non-humans, uh, mainly uh, chimpanzees, I mean great apes, um, can reason about others' behaviors in terms of observables or they can actually perceive, understand that they have goals and and intentions and, and so on? Well, to me, the debate's over, but that's, uh, uh, that's a, a one-sided uh, thing, I guess. Uh, the, 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 the opponents on that debate are, uh, you know, Daniel Povinelli and Celia Hayes. This is the, what you're talking about, right? Okay. Uh, and they basically just want to argue that in principle, 
you could explain all of these things by behavior reading or behavior rules of, of some type. Um, but to explain the behaviors in from our experiments, for example, they have to make up potential learning histories that the animal could have, they could have had this kind of experience, they could have had that kind of experience. They have zero evidence for the animals actually having these experiences. And in fact, we've given them novel tasks that which they could have no experience. And they say, well, they're just generalizing. This is stimulus generalization. So this is the talk of behaviorism. Uh, and, and, and they're not, in, in normal science, what you would do, and, and I understand that working with chimpanzees is a special uh, challenge because not everybody has them, <laughs> uh, but uh, in normal science, you would have, if you had that critique, you would do another experiment that showed, indeed, that uh, what we thought was reading goals and reading others' perceptions was actually behavior reading. There are no such experiments. They're, they just have lower level interpretations of our experiments and hypothetical learning uh, uh, sequences. I'll also say that I think that the argument that, um, that if it's learned, it's not cognitive <laughs> is a bogus argument. It's an argument from behaviorism. You know, I learned calculus. I worked really hard at it, okay? But I learned every bit of it uh, from other people. Uh, uh, and it doesn't mean it's not intelligent, the fact that I learned it. So that they think, they, they sort of want to argue, if we can construct a learning history whereby the animal could have learned it, then it's not cognitive. And that's, that's a bogus argument. So I actually think they are just coming from, a more, in Celia's case, a behavioristic framework. That's her learning. Uh, sh she'll insist I'm an association learning theorist, not a behaviorist, but that's just a label. Um, and in Povinelli's case, um, uh, he's not a behaviorist, but he has somehow um, adopted the mantle of this, uh, this low-level, wanting to go the low-level interpretation. And, um, I, and of course, he hasn't done any experiments in quite a while himself. So I just, uh, to me, th that argument is over. And um, I thought you were going to ask me uh, how I have uh, yielded to uh, uh, Andy's uh, research on imitation, and, and I have uh, re relaxed my hard line on uh, imitation in the light of Andy's results, and that's, uh, and that's true. So um, uh, uh, I actually was somewhat hard line minimalist myself on the imitation, and then as the data began rolling in, uh, mainly from Andy's uh, lab, um, uh, I think they're, they're doing more than I thought. <laughs> uh, and it's still, even in Andy's studies, the kids are quantitatively superior yeah. imitators, yeah. Sure. but the apes are doing a lot more than I thought. And so that's why, to hearken back to this issue that we've been talking about, I, in recent things, have been putting a lot more emphasis on teaching uh, rather than that humans are sort of quantitatively better imitators, but it's the teaching that's the real locks in, if you use my ratchet metaphor, the teaching is what really locks in the, uh, the, the uh, progress in a particular thing so that uh, it can, say, stabilize so that innovations uh, um, can then occur. So, um, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's, a, that, that's a, those are uh, just free associating positions uh, that are controversial in my case. So I would hold the line on the, on the uh, um, intention reading and, um, and uh, lighten up a bit on the, um, on the imitation. Yeah, but actually, if I could just add to that, I mean, I think it, kind of the same things happened on the, the theory of mind front as well, the mind reading front. So Dick, all that stuff that Dick Byrne and I uh, did on tactical deception, which was based on just purely observational interpretations of wild animals uh, interacting, uh, you were skeptical of that. Mm -hmm. uh, does that really show mind reading? No, we need to do the experiments. So you went and did the experiments. Great. And uh, the, these two sets of... <coughs> observational uh, studies in the wild and experimental studies in, in captivity, I think, have, have converged so that we've kind of, uh, we've we come together in a way, you know, one would like to see science acting like that more often. Um, yeah? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, I will say that part of, part of my motivation uh, at, in, in being somewhat skeptical at the beginning was uh, more of a methodological thing, being an experimentalist by temperament there were the, all these field workers who were making these big claims. Our, we started our stuff on imitation because Jane Goodall and some other people had said that the tool use in chimpanzees was transmitted culturally. 
but there was but there was no real evidence other than you know they didn't have the either the either the geographical variation they didn't have the cultural variation as observations they didn't have any experimental whatever and um, and so uh, it was like well we need to be skeptical until we actually have some experimental demonstration I understand not everybody agree, you know thinks that experiments are the be all and end all but uh, that's uh, that's my orientation that was and that was part of my uh, challenge in the in the early uh, animal culture stuff was let's show some experimental uh, evidence for it uh, and as the experimental evidence ha actually has started building up then we're coming to more of a consensus. Yeah and <laughs> sorry to add one more to that that we, I think uh, to me I'm an eth ethologist really at heart you know that's where I, where I come from and the ethologist dream is the field experiment so it's put, putting together, as it were, building on your observations of natural behavior, which I think is where everything ought to start, um, compensating for some of the, the limitations of the lab work, which you know, we all acknowledge you know, is, uh, obviously ha has its limitations in terms of being ecologically valid. And so if you can do a f an experiment in the field, great. But for the reasons that uh, I think Mike, Mike mentioned earlier, you know, that's dif difficult to get the control. But it has now started. So in the case of social learning, you know, we've got a handful of, of experiments, not only with primates, but with various species manipulating things in the wild. Um, and I think, to me, you know, that's particularly uh, valuable. Perhaps just... But difficult. Oh, could I just say, Sorry. you know, Sorry. I showed... Uh, we've, we've done these experiments now with vervet monkeys. The, I showed you the one with the pink and the blue food. We've also done ones with our artificial fruits and so on. And, you know, that's great. We've tried with chimpanzees. We, with Christoph Bursch, I collaborated. We had this big sort of artificial thing in the forest. We couldn't get the chimpanzees to touch it. Um, they're so mm -hmm. neophobic. You know, like you say, they don't want to explore the, these things. Uh, it's quite an interesting contrast with the way you think about great apes in captivity, you know, exploratory, creative, innovative, whatever. Um, quite a contrast. So maybe we'll get there in the end, but it's good at least to start with the vervet monkeys. <laughs> maybe just to add one thing about the, the importance of field studies, the sort of the synergistic relationship between field observations and experiments, especially in captivity because of the greater control, I, I tried to argue yesterday, and I think Kevin has convinced us totally today, that you know, historically, psychologists were not interested in social learning, with a very small exception, you know, a small group around Jeff Galef sort of doing this. And I think, as I tried to say yesterday, it's the new normal, right? Uh, there's so much going on in, in terms of social learning among animals that we have not seen before. And it was because of the Dane Goodles of this world saying, hey, I think our chimps have culture. Uh, to which the response then comes, ah, come on, and, and let's do the experiments. And now, of course, we, we're reaching the synthesis. So this, this synergistic relationship is important. And of course, the reason I say this is that I have the impression that field work is sort of getting increasingly out of fashion. And I think in, in the end, it is sort of the engine of all our inspiration. So let's not forget about field work. Sorry if I get no. It's a talkative bunch. That's why. Uh, that, that, that's why. You, that, that's why you got us. But uh, if I can just add to that, I want to say, as a, an, someone who's an experimentalist, uh, that I absolutely endorse the idea that field work is the beginning of everything. It presents the problems. And again, if I can do a little more behaviorist bashing, uh, uh, I grew up in America in behaviorist psychology departments. The <laughs> you, you Europeans didn't have to suffer through that, but but I did, uh, and um, that. That was the old days where they did experiments on discrimination learning and reversal learning and all that and with no uh, um, uh, um, idea of the species' particular adaptive problems or anything like that. And they would then do these ridiculous uh, comparisons between bees and ants, uh, you know, bees and mice and uh, rhesus monkeys and, and humans. Um, without any consideration of, the, of, of their uh, ecological context and their adaptive uh, proclivities. Um, and so what we've always done, I start, all of my stuff has started with Jane Goodall's challenge of the culture in chimpanzees or, or their challenge on tactical deception and mind reading uh, from natural observations in the wild and say, well, let's take that to the lab. So it's not experiments uh, divorced from that, but it's the, it's the uh, I think that, and I think it's also different domains. I've had this debate with my colleague Christoph Bosch on a number of occasions. There are certain things about the feeding ecology 
of a certain species that captivity is and, and experiments are going to help with very little. I mean, maybe a little bit here and there, pre food preferences or something, but mainly you have to see what do they do in the wild. That's your question. But cognitive questions are always the problem. With, in, in the issue cognition is always about that the same behavior may be generated by different underlying cognitive mechanisms. And there, you need experiments. Field experiments would be the best, but you need experiments to tease apart the different mechanisms. You need control conditions. You need to uh, compare. So field work is the starting point, And in cognition, it needs to be complemented by experiments. Maybe you've got time to make up some question. Um, any question from? Yeah. What two, but I have to select. I got one specific question. Is this? I've got one specific. This I open it to Mike, but then you can discuss. I have heard a lot of the defend of and, and, and data defending the the large brain hypothesis, but I was struck by a, a colleague of Mike, Brian Hare, and his self domestication hypothesis in uh, with the dogs, bonobos. Um, human self-domestication hypothesis, where they give data that in modern humans brain size has decreased compared to the so uh, I want to uh, if you can s share your view about this data with all the, the data that the, the or brain well, size well if we can if we can invert the normal thing size doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's say <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Neanderthals had slightly bigger brains on average than modern humans. Much of the modern human sample comes from northern Europe, the first Argnasian and, and the first people that came to northern Europe. They're quite large people. Uh, and, and these are very small differences. And so, first of all, it's not clear whether you should correct for body size when you're doing brain size. That's a question by itself. And the methods for doing that, you know, these allometric comparisons, when you're getting to little differences like that, I think is mainly numerology. I mean, it's not, it, these aren't real differences. I mean, there's a big, big difference in overall body size across latitude and so on. And the idea that humans have gotten smaller brains in some systematic way over the last 30 or 40,000 years, I think is completely unproven. Now, it is true we've gotten much smaller teeth. So you might be able to make something out of that. But brains, I don't think so. So it's quite clear in mammals that the bulk of the variation in, in brain size is explained by, by body size. And um, you know there are various theories for that. But it, it, there seems to be a very strong correlation between uh, brain size and um, non-adipose tissue. So um, it, it, it looks to me like um, you know, Brain size um, is, is pretty much explained by the view of how many cells you need to process in the body. Um, uh, but I think that humans have um, had this rather anthropocentric perspective in thinking about brain size, and this has affected our science. Um, we look around and we see elephants that have got bigger brains than us, and whales that have got bigger brains than us, and then we arrogantly think, well, we're, we're surely smarter than them, so uh, absolute brain size can't be that important. Let's, let's control for, for body size. And, um, you know, I'm, be, I'm being slightly facetious. You can make a sensible argument along those lines, but I, I think the problem is that the, that the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater here, and there's actually something which is incredibly interesting about absolute brain size. You have to look at it within relevant taxa. So it's not relevant to, it's not, it's not appropriate to compare humans and, and whales. They're, they're subject to two different kinds of selection pressures. But if we look, if we look in primates, then interesting things do happen as brain size gets larger. You, you, you get reduced connectivity. Inevitably you do, because, uh, because if you had every, every neuron connecting to every other neuron, um, the, the, the connectivity costs would increase 
geometrically, it's, it just becomes uh, infeasible. So inevitably, as brains get larger, you get, you get more subdivision, you get more substructure, you get more modular brains, you get, as Terence Deacon has, has, has pointed out, larger brain structures exerting more executive control over smaller ones. This has all kinds of ramifications for, ha for, for brain functioning. And so um, we, we, we need to think, I think, a lot more about what difference it makes to have a, a big brain in absolute terms. There was another question. Um, in human language learning, there is an enormous role which is started to be uh, researched that for covert imitation. Covert. Um, I, I am not completely sure what you mean when you talk about copying. I, I suppose one is talking about roughly behaviorally measurable imitation. Roughly, yeah? Um, in the, it, this phenomenon of covert imitation, which is everything has been prepared for the organism to produce an, an observable imitation, but it wasn't observable because it it didn't get to that point. The rest of the processes, the, the rest of the mental pro processes and the preparation of the articulatory system to give a response were there. There is a, a, apparently a, an, an enormous covert imitation activity displayed by very small children in their language learning process. There is also simultaneously uh, an important overt imitation, behaviorally, reg uh, which can be registered behaviorally. Okay, um, I, I don't know in, in the least, I, I don't know at all where, whether there is any uh, reflection of covert imitation, any study, any possibility, any consideration when one is studying cognition in animals. I, this I, I completely ignore, I would like to know. Um, at the same time, not, I don't really think it's so necessary. I think behaviorally done studies like the ones we've heard here are more than informative. I'm not saying I think it's a need, but I do think they might be a need from a theoretical point of view. Uh, in the sense that not necessarily all behavioral outcomes of learning have been created by uh, overt imitation, covert imitation might have been playing a role. This is true in humans. Um, I don't know anything about animal behavior here. Thank you. Um, well, okay, I'm not, so you're talking about covert imitation, which I take to be where there is a, where some internal uh, representation of what you've seen is there, uh, but not expressed in the way that overt imitation would be. Um, and what that conjures up in my mind that, that might be relevant to that in animals is what we'd call delayed imitation, because <laughs> unless there is ultimately some imitation I'm not sure how you would know there had been covert imitation to begin with. So a um, good example of that might be um, birdsong learning, where we know that the young bird sort of listens to its parent, nothing happens. A year later, it, it, it uh, as it were, starts to match what, what it sings to a template that, that, that was recorded there. So you might regard that as some kind of covert imitation and we know in other species there is delayed imitation for example in apes uh, that, 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 that's been shown that they may watch something and then sometime later uh, pr produce the, the, the copy that's um, it, does that start to address what yeah, you're asking yeah 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 sure one of the one of the consequences of covert imitation might be delayed imitation that's for sure no, no. In humans, it is possible to measure electromyographic responses of oh. the articulatory system and listen to no um, overt response at all. I'm talking about language learning and even observe the movements uh, of tongue and lips. But all this myographic response of the articulatory system is quite clear, as well as the pupil dilation uh, response. Mm, no, but I, what I was talking about is I don't know which I'm happy you bring delayed 
um, imitation as a phenomenon that has been observed already in animals. And I keep wondering whether um, the results we have been uh, learning about today and, and yesterday might have in any might have something to do with covert imitation uh, processes going by at the same time as the others. This is only adding to the to the sack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not sure I have any more to respond uh, on that. Before, oh, sorry. One very quick question, maybe a question of semantics of ontology. We have seen the debate about behavioralism and turning into sort of culture uh, studies, etc. Why is it that during the two days I've been here, I haven't heard anything about consciousness? Is there still some sort of scientific rejection, starting from Romanes and Darwin up until today, while, if I'm not, I'm in the school of psychology, we are here. Well, psychiatry and scientific study of consciousness has really advanced a lot at, at this in humans, connected with neuroscience. Why is it? Is this, there some sort of bias, fear? Uh, uh, it's a question of philosophers living it there. There's no scientific approach to consciousness that might relate to the theory of mind, to all this sort of adaptive, intuitive teaching, etc. Or, or is it simply a background type of professional education in which you are taught not to talk about consciousness simply because you might be thrown out of the academy as it happened up until 1962 in France, in London, or in Spain, I don't know, in, not in the US, by the way. Naturalists in the US in the 19th century were much more approached to talk about consciousness than Europeans, actually, probably because they interacted in their backyards much more with <laughs> wild animals, so they knew, or they considered that to be, or is it a semantic issue, or a principal issue, or why is it? Uh, if I knew what it was, I might study it. Or maybe a counter question, what would one need to do? What, what, what would, how would all we do be different if we include, explicitly include consciousness into our explanatory frameworks? Okay, I'm, I wanted to ask, uh, okay. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to refrain, okay. So, um, yeah, one question about consciousness is, I think one open question, well, there are lots of open questions about consciousness, but um, one question is, um, if consciousness doesn't have a, doesn't provide with an evolutionary advantage, why do we have it? Um, so we could, th we could think of a system which behaves as humans or ha animals. Um, if consciousness is just an epiphenomenon, then it doesn't provide us with an evolutionary advantage. Um, could you could you tell us what consciousness is, and then and then and then we'll say if it has if, well consciousness we awareness the fact that. Um, we have a subjective um, experience, just that. Um, without, without addressing specifically the issue of, of consciousness, I, I don't think we need to infer, just because it's there, that there must be an evolutionary advantage. There are many traits that, uh, that organisms possess, which are just historical legacies, that are no longer advantageous, that have, uh, that have, that have arisen because of drift or uh, some other selection process like mutation, that are, are, are not adaptations, they're exaptations, have arisen uh, because of other um, uh, traits that are favored by selection or have been favored um, as, as a result of correlated selection. So there are all kinds of reasons why things can be present uh, without them being favored by selection. So I don't think we need to draw that inference about consciousness or indeed anything else. Adaptations are something that really have to be proven, demonstrated scientifically. And, and, and if, you're, if you're just saying, 
subjective experience, that's, is it just perception? I mean, if it's just... For example, a, yes. Well, okay, well then that's going to be all of the animals we've been talking about are going to register perceptual experiences and, and act on them and whatnot. Um, yes, I'm not, yeah, I'm not making a difference here between humans and other species. I'm just saying that... Um, it just goes along with perception if you're going to define it that way. It's just part of the perceptual process. Uh, so why, yeah, why, why, does, why do we have, why, why are we perceptual beings? I mean, you could imagine a system which doesn't have perception as something subjective, but still behaves well, well, in the certainly, same way. Certainly, if, uh, <clears throat> if we think about uh, organisms that we think about are acting intelligently, and I would say in a broad sense, that would be all of them, invertebrates and everybody acting intelligently in the broad sense, we only know one way of constructing an intelligent system. There's only one way. And that's the way we build our cybernetic uh, um, feedback systems. That is, it has to have a goal state that it's trying to either achieve or maintain, and it has to have some perceptual capacities for determining uh, how to get there and if indeed it has attained that state. And that's the negative feedback control loop that you have to have. You, ha you can't just behave without knowing its results or it won't be adaptive. You have to, under you have to know the results of your action and see if it meets the goal. Yes, but I don't see that that implies necessarily uh, perception. I mean, you could have an internal representation that is not linked to a subjective experience of goals. Um. Uh, I think it's a great question. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, because um, it, it may not be a, an adaptation in the sense that, you know, Kev Kevin's just explained, but it... it it seems to me it needs, it needs explain, you know, it begs an explanation. I mean, we do have this phenomenal consciousness, and yet our contemporary sort of model of the way the mind and the brain works is, is basically a computational system. Um, and you could imagine that computational system working just fine without having the phenomenal consciousness we have. So, to me, it's a, it, it's a sort of made major mystery. Um, and as far as I can see, nobody has the faintest idea why it happens to be like that. I mean, people like Dennett have come out, you know, writing books saying, you know, consciousness explained. I, I read that and I read other ones and I said, okay, I, I don't see it. Sorry, you haven't explained it. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, so I think nobody's explained it. No, I, I agree. But, but one, but one <laughs> uh, obviously, I agree with that. But, uh, but one thing is we've talked a little bit here about uh, executive function. There, there, uh, certainly all, I, I don't know how far down it goes, but certainly all mammals, you can see them starting to do something and pausing and, ch and they're imagining that what result will happen if I do this. So there's some executive function. You can, you can inhibit responses, in, for example, in the, in the presence of dominant animals or all that. So I think maybe something along the way toward what people are probing at when they talk about consciousness is this dual level, which is widespread in animals, uh, of uh, an action level uh, uh, and, a, and a monitoring level. Uh, that can inhibit and, ch and make choices between to when you have two equal goals or two similar goals, choosing between them, inhibiting a, a prepotent response and whatnot. Um, and, and the human um, um, executive function system may have some special uh, qualities in it. The, the um, George Herbert Mead and people like that have, have, have you know, proposed this social uh, self-regulation in humans and whatnot. So anyway, I, I, I don't use the term consciousness when I talk about that because I don't, because it seems to me it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but um, it seems to me that goes in the direction of what people are uh, um, wanting to explain when they want to explain consciousness. <laughs> Eh, si no te importa me la traduces eh, oyendo todas las charlas me sorprende y quería saber un poco qué piensan de las consecuencias de que actualmente en nuestra cultura se penalice la imitación incluso la enseñanza se fomenta la creatividad la enseñanza basada en el aprendizaje si eso podría tener algunas consecuencias a lo largo de lo que es la acumulación de cultura o, o cómo evolucionaría un poco una sociedad que iba a ser más como a lo mejor la japonesa en la imitación y la nuestra que penaliza mucho la imitación en casi todos los contextos. I'm not sure if I got the point. 
Um, I think you are saying that um, in some societies, uh, education at school um, is pen penalized if it is not, if, if uh, people uh, just imitate, they learn from teachers or whatever, and they, do, they instead, they are encouraged to construct and to be active in, in their own um, learning and education. Is that the point? Yeah, in general. So what would be the, the consequence? Whether those, uh, these different approach to learning and education um, could have bad consequences or, I mean, what would be your view about this? <laughs> well, this was something with which uh, Vygotsky was especially concerned that, that uh, on Piaget as well, um, uh, um, Piaget used to uh, say something like, um, uh, every time you teach a child something, you deprive them of the opportunity of learning it for themselves. Uh, uh, so uh, there's, there's a, a, an interesting study that came out recently, Bonowitz uh, et al., where they have a, a, a toy that has three things you can do to it. If you give it to children, eventually they discover all three things. If you teach them, oh, here's how you do this, and you show them one of the things, they never discover the other two. And they call this the double-edged sword of pedagogy. So we've all been, we've all been uh, uh, playing up uh, pedagogy, and of course it's absolutely critical uh, for, uh, uh, for developing in the world that we uh, uh, humans develop in. Uh, but it, it does have the, uh, the opposite side of blind conformity, which is the, which is the, uh, the negative side of it. Uh, and I think the, uh, the ultimate uh, answer is uh, that you can, uh, I and other people have distinguished between different types of imitation that can start at, Im at mimicking. So when we say somebody's mimicking, we say they're copying the surface thing, but they don't really know what they're doing. Uh, and then there is something deeper where you've taught me something and not only am I going to copy what you taught me to do, but I now understand why I'm doing it. And if you understand why you're doing it, then if some novelty comes up, some new situation, you're not stuck with blindly doing the same thing over and over again and hoping it works. You can adjust it because you know why the thing works. So I would say that pedagogically, you, uh, you strive for a situation where you get both. <laughs> you teach them new ways of doing and thinking, and you teach them the reasons why this is better than other ways of doing it, so that if novelties come up, uh, they can adjust to them uh, without uh, a tutor. Um, so uh, I think there's uh, some confusion that's been created by different uses of the word teaching by different disciplines. So when anthropologists, one of the things, if you talk to cultural anthropologists, they'll tell you that teaching is a Western thing, that, that, uh, that other people don't teach. And um, the reason they say that is they mean classroom teaching, basically. Uh, uh, highly structured uh, specialists uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, it's surprising how little we know about the prevalence cross-culturally of the more subtle kinds of teaching that people here are talking about. Uh, um, uh, but I think what we do know suggests that it's extremely common uh, everywhere. And at least it's not absent for sure. And uh, so uh, I don't think we really know how much very, so if we think of most cultural, cultural skills being transmitted not in formal universities or schools but through various forms of in, in, informal pedagogy, I don't think we know how variable that is cross-culturally really. We don't have the kinds of studies that you would need to ha estimate whether it's more in Western societies or less. I really don't think we know. There, um, there are um, a, a lot of the objections that some of the anthropologists make is that because there's not this active verbal instruction, but in all those cultures, people like Barbara Rogoff and people have looked at, um, the children are expected to watch and learn how to make tortillas or watch and learn how to make an arrow or whatever, uh, and the children sort of naturally do it, and so there's not this verbal um, direct instruction, but they're expected to learn through observation, and, and they're expected to, that's the point. It's not just that they like doing it themselves, which they do, but they're expected to by the parents. Yeah, uh, I mean, am I on? Yeah. 
What I don't think, well, I, I agree completely, but I think what we don't know is, so just an anecdote, an ethnographic anecdote. <clears throat> I was watching, actually the same person that was in the picture I showed, a man butchering a turtle. And um, uh, everybody was watching, the kids especially. You know, they were, everybody's crowded around, partly because they wanted, you know, turtles are very attractive, but also partly because it's really interesting. But then at one moment, uh, he uh, took his knife and he put it next to the gallbladder, which is this uh, nasty bit that, uh, uh, and then he looks at his daughter who's, who's um, watching him and then looks back at the, at the gallbladder and nicks it out. And now that's from my point of view a form of, of teaching because he's saying to the, He's, he's saying to the, well, I know you, this is your idea, but, but I mean, it was, an, it was an example, and no one writes that stuff down. Right. Anthropologists right. don't, they haven't, by and large, they haven't been interested in those kinds of, of behaviors, so we don't, don't know how common that kind of behavior is. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that, uh, that's the case, again, where I would say you're expected to learn, so watch this and learn. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, so there's all this, the turtles thrashing around, and people are laughing, there's all this stuff going on. He's saying... This is something to learn. This I, is I this is generalizable I knowledge. Teachable yeah. moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but let me just say say real quickly that uh, uh, so for example if you had another I don't know what another species of turtle another something else and the child wanted to know hmm should I nick the gallbladder act out on this one. You need to know whether it generalizes this new situation or not. So I was just saying that the, the ideal mode of pedagogy is that you not only know you should do this, but you know why you should do it so that if the situation changes, you can adapt without having to go back to the teacher again. Okay, we're going to have a discussion here, actually. But, so <laughs> I think often people don't know, though. Right. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's true. And, and so they, you can only do it yeah. by statistics. Uh, uh, and, absolutely and true. I think they do know why they... The, gallbladder tastes bad and, and that's easy but yeah. other things like well yeah. and, you know th there's a bunch of things where people accumulate knowledge and they they believe stuff but they don't they have no causal connection to other things they believe about no I know and again uh, Vygotsky was uh, very big on this that that young children learn lots of things by imitating and mimicking and whatever that they don't really know what they're doing <laughs> uh, uh, and, and this kind of pulls them up it kind of bootstraps them uh, uh, into the understanding on, uh, which, uh, on, on their own later we are out of time so there's just time for two questions there. hello hi I just want to ask a very very simple question at the beginning, you, you, uh, one of you spoke about there's a one million years where nothing kind of changed. The shapes of tools didn't change very much. Is, is that what you said? Actually, in tools, yeah. Yes. Is that the t period of time that they speak about a, a possible missing link? Like I said, it's a very basic, basic. Is this the time that they wondered, is there a missing link? Mm -hmm. I, is there such a thing as a missing link between age? There are no missing links. There are no missing links. I, I'm at, that's what I'm asking. It, the paleontological record for humans is extremely good for a land vertebrate, uh, especially a rare land vertebrate. Uh, if we were chimpanzees, we would have to believe in special creation. There's basically only one fossil between six million years ago and now for, for chimpanzees. But humans, there are literally tens of thousands of fossils, and in that period for the Achillean, we probably have, I mean, if you count teeth as fossils, thousands of, of hominin fossils from two million years ago to a million years ago, say. I, there just isn't any missing link. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with that, but I wasn't sure if that's really what you're asking, or, okay. or, or if you're asking, are the hominins who were making these tools what we kind of think of as a missing link, as an intermediate stage no, to did, ourselves? Did or? you not, you know, but you said there was a, a kind of a million years when not a lot changed, the tools didn't change, there was no advancement. Yes. Is this the period of time where the, the, the question is, is that, was there a missing link between ape, ape and man? You know, if, if what if you're was, asking is what, 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 the was, what were the hominins like who were doing this? Yes. Um, well, and for why, example, why in, brain, in brain size, they were somewhat intermediate between a chimpanzee and ourselves. And, you know, maybe... The, Presumably, that brain size had something to do with um, this, this relative stasis in, in the Julian. 
We know a bunch about them. They were terrestrial, so so they're committed bipeds. They had the same kind of relative leg and arm length that we have. They had reduced sexual dimorphism compared to other uh, apes. So if you go back before that to the earlier tools, males were maybe half again as big as females. Um, when you get to Homo erectus, the sexual dimorphism is like modern humans. Um, uh, I think, so what else do we know about them? Um, they lived, they were the first hominins to escape Africa, so uh, they lived all over the temperate old world. Um, um, they were almost certainly predators, uh, at least partly. Um, so we know a lot about these creatures. I um, mean, what we'd like to know a lot more, but, but uh, it's not, they're not a mysterious, unknown world. Last question over there. Um, yes, uh, it's more like a little reflection on many of the things that uh, I have uh, seen in, in, in the symposium, uh, in the, um, uh, this workshop. One of the things from, from the point of view of a developmental psychologist uh, uh, that has really, uh, that I have learned <laughs> from uh, these two days is the challenge on the uniqueness of um, human species in many different uh, areas that we consider uh, special or specific of our species. Uh, the intelligence or uh, the imitation, etc. Although in all those things, again, if we look, uh, it might not be a question of size, of quantity, but that's certainly a question of quality. So when you talk about executive function, for example, um, and, and this G in general, uh, many of the examples that you provided yesterday involve um, inhibition or I involve the contribution of working memory, mm -hmm. but what they do not involve is a combination of inhibiting a proportion uh, response uh, while holding in mind uh, some kind of culturally mediated or arbitrary information. And that, uh, I think, is a still specific of our children and many other things. But I, I don't want to go one by one or the same with imitation. We say that children tend to over-imitate. Um, they tend to do so when they are three or five, the children you have seen, in a very similar task. Children don't do that um, when, uh, when they are 18 or 24 months of age, but they learn to do that at that point, etc. So <laughs> there are uh, all those uh, qualitative uh, changes there. Well, in any way, the conclusion of all <laughs> these uh, challenges to the uniqueness of um, the human uh, cognitive or sociocognitive abilities is not uh, social learning, it's not the G, etc. And it seems to come to teaching in the end. Um, um, however, that something that surprised me is we have looked at the strategies for so, uh, social learning in children or in chimpanzees or other species. We haven't looked at the strategies, and there must be also universal strategies for teaching, or more generally, for communication. They necessarily have to have co-evolved. And we have some examples of that, as Mike was pointing out, before teaching can take place in the communication be between the human infants and the, uh, and the adults. Um, so it's just a point that we also need to look at the interaction and look at maybe those universal cultural practices. There might be differences according to different cultures, but there are also must be universal cultural practices that make us uniquely human in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should. Uh, just no, we shouldn't. Just a, a, a quick point in case there, there is any doubt. I don't, I don't think any of us would want to argue that the difference between humans and other animals is solely down to teaching, right? There is a whole suite of, of, of characteristics. Uh, I mean, teaching, language, and Mike mentioned a whole bunch of things about shared intentionality, and uh, there's, a, there's a package of sociocultural uh, capabilities that we humans have, and I think Carl and I, and probably the other um, speakers here, think that, uh, that there was a gene culture co-evolutionary dynamic which uh, in, in the, somewhere during, during that history of the species has, has, has led to the, the evolution of this uh, unique combination of, of, of capabilities, but it's certainly far broader than just teaching. And maybe just one, one point. Um, 
I think it would be very interesting to look at the ontogeny of executive function and, and comparing apes and humans, for instance. I, I know Mike doesn't say anything, but I think he's actually studying that right now, I think with very surprising results. I, I, we have a paper, that I, I think it's, it's online published, I don't know if it's out or not, with three and five year old um, kids and chimps on a battery of executive function tasks. Um, it's delay of gratification, uh, persistence in the, with the uh, distractions, persistence in failure, changing a strategy when it doesn't work anymore. And there's a fifth one that I can't remember. Oh, doing something um, uh, unpleasant for a, for a longer goal. Uh, um, and uh, uh, what we find is a more or less comparability between children, uh, three-year-old children and chimps, and I think it was six-year-old children, not five, and six-year-old children are, are very different. And I think that accords with what I know about the literature on executive function and emotion regulation, which is the more uh, the social side of it, um, in human children, which is that there are huge differences between three and six years of age. And that indeed is why six years of age marks the age of reason uh, in a lot, of, a lot of people. That's when you start formal schooling, literacy, numeracy in Traditional cultures, that's the age at which uh, you start letting the boys watch the cattle. That's the stage where you start trusting kids to take a message from village to village. So there's a certain amount of executive control, uh, rational judgment or whatever, uh, that I think executive function plays into uh, that develops a lot between three and six years of age. So, uh, yeah. Let me amplify what, what Kevin said. Uh, it's way more than, than I mean, there are many, many morphological and physiological changes uh, between chimpanzees and humans. Our hands are different, our guts are different. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So the idea that it's just teaching or just culture is, it can't be right, right? It's a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, with Kevin, I think it co-evolved with um, culture and, and increased intelligence and all that stuff. I'm afraid we have to stop here. And uh, I would like to thank the speakers for these great uh, talks they gave and uh, for coming, obviously. And thank the uh, um, audience for attending and for participating in this debate. So thanks.